So hi, everybody. Welcome to ncoronavirus.org community action meeting. It's great to see all these new faces today, as well as some familiar ones. Uh, we have Vicki Vandertalk from the Zero COVID Alliance. Uh, she's from the Netherlands, and she has been building out other COVID alliances in the Europe area. And she has some great suggestions for, for doing so. I'm going to just ask what everyone um, if they're not talking, I did mute you if you were, <laughs> if you were sending in some feedback. So uh, don't be offended. <laughs> um, so that's Vicki. We also have Briggs Klinko from Tucson, Arizona. She has done a great job also building community action in her area. And we have Tiffany James from South Carolina, who has also built community action in her area. So we'll have some time to hear from those folks to hear what their experience was, um, their unique experience, challenges and accomplishments in their area. Um, first, um, I will um, ask to hear from uh, Vicki to speak about her experience in the Netherlands. And after that, we'll go to Briggs and Tiffany, they can all speak for a few minutes, speaking about their experiences. Um, we may have um, another and coronavirus mentor sign on. Um, his name is Joaquin Beltran. And if he signs on, we'll also hear from him. And then I will turn to the group to see who feels comfortable sharing their experience in their own local community to see, you know, what they've done, what they've tried, what they've tried to do, and you and we can talk about um, how to get you moving forward. Um, and maybe you can pick a mentor for yourself and we'll go from there. So uh, Vicki, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thanks. Just, just something to look at uh, from my cursory read of uh, uh, Vicki, for some reason, um, we're hearing another sound come through. It sounds like a man on the TV. Maybe that's okay. It's so not here. <laughs> okay, I think that was someone else that wasn't muted. So I just muted them. So if you okay, wouldn't great. mind starting again, and I'll I'm gonna spotlight you for everyone. Sure. Hi everyone. Uh, so happy that so many of you joined. Uh, I'm Vicky van der Tocht. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and I have been involved in the action group. It's a zero COVID action group um, called Containment New uh, since March. Uh, we have been advocating for a containment strategy uh, because we are one of the few countries that actually opted for a herd immunity strategy uh, way back in March. And obviously, uh, some people in the country already knew that wa that wasn't such a great idea. Uh, but unfortunately, the media didn't pick up on that at all. Uh, so we figured that something needed to happen. So we decided to organize into a group. Um, so from there, uh, it kind of grew. Uh, we set up our own website. We set up our own communications. Um, and in the next couple of months, we really got some traction. Uh, we have managed to reach out to the media, to policymakers, uh, to just spread the word on that containment is possible and it is really something that we should work towards. Um, and after a couple of months, it turned out that there were other uh, groups emerging from other countries. Um, we saw a group in Sweden. Uh, of course, Sweden was also opting for a herd immunity strategy. Uh, so they already had their own group uh, trying to to kind of fight the media and, and fight against the, the government um, strategy. Uh, so there was this group in Sweden. There was also a group in the UK uh, who was trying to do the same. Uh, and we were from there on out, we were kind of searching for other groups around the world who did the same thing. Um, and we saw that there weren't many others. Uh, so we decided that it, it was probably up to us to make sure that these kinds of groups uh, would uh, start in their own in their own country. Uh, so we tried to do everything to make that happen. Uh, we decided to to set up the Zero COVID Alliance uh, to make sure that all these groups have the resources that they need uh, to get into action, um, that they have all the information and also that they have the support uh, that's really necessary in this time because it is uh, it can be difficult. 
uh, to, to go against your government, uh, especially when uh, most of the population completely trusts the government. Uh, so from there on out, um, this really grew. Uh, we didn't know what to expect when we started, um, because like I said, there were only like a handful of groups around the world. Uh, but since we started, and this was in August, um, we have found all kinds of groups around the world. Uh, there are like over uh, 40 at the moment that I know of, and these are both um, zero COVID groups as well as long COVID groups. And we are now trying to gather all the groups from around the world under one overarching platform, uh, which is called the Zero COVID Alliance. Um, and we're trying to help all these groups uh, with the, the subject that they're working on uh, because it's not all the same. Uh, you think that maybe uh, they're all just advocating for a zero COVID strategy, but some are only focusing on long COVID advocacy. Uh, some are focusing on PPE, getting the PPE to all the healthcare workers. Uh, some are just working on providing the right information because their government doesn't do so. Um, so there are so many different topics to focus on when it comes to community action. And really my conclusion has been that every single person can make a change, however small or big, um, if you're willing to step up, then you can already do some good, uh, whether that's in a group or just on your own. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to um, encourage people to do. And we're doing everything uh, in our power to, to make it happen and to, to help them on their way. Um, so I'm also really happy that all of you are here. Um, we would like to help you on your way as well. Um, and if you need help with that, um, I'm here. You can always reach out to me. Uh, I will share some links to uh, the groups as well. So there's Containment New. That's the, the group in the Netherlands. And then um, we have the Zero COVID Alliance. And on there, you can find all the partners from around the world. We were so happy over the last couple of weeks to find that so many more people are getting into action. Um, we have actually managed to um, get five new partners in the last week. So it's, uh, it really seems like people are now more willing to step up. Um, and of course, uh, we're happy to help wherever we can. That is, uh, that is it for now. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk some more later on, but let others introduce themselves first. Great. Thank you so much, Vicky. Yeah, your work has been really admirable and um, just so helpful. I'd like to welcome Yanir on the call. So hi, Yanir. Um, he helped us start in coronavirus and um, has been our, our fearless leader. So thank you, Yanir, for joining us today as well. Um, Briggs, would you like to speak about your experiences out in Arizona and how that came to form? Hi, welcome. My name is Briggs Klinko. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Um, this is a community that's uh, just about an hour north of the Mexican border in southern Arizona. Um, I started volunteering for N Coronavirus uh, back in March. I'm a performer, so there's not too much for me out there um, without with the isolation lifestyle. Um, I also come from a background of nonprofit and home care administration um, and community action. Um, through volunteering at N Coronavirus in the early parts of the pandemic, um, I was really encouraged that anyone, as Vicki was recently saying, can be part of the action here. Something really unique that N Coronavirus is offering in, in, the, in the pandemic is a solution. We're offering a solution-based response to this pandemic. Um, as an eternal optimist, this is uh, really appealing to me. Um, I, I, I would like to get back to high quality of life for children, seniors, and all peoples. Um, adopting a solution-based approach is a really hard thing for any community to take on, even a community of one. It's hard to believe that you can do something or that there is actually a good outcome. Um, I started my journey um, doing outreach in Tucson by reaching out to local politicians. Started with uh, uh, someone who was the, uh, on the governing board of our large community college system. And through that, I was able to connect into our mayor's office. 
I started reaching out to connect with nonprofit organizations. I didn't have to do this alone. I was backed up by a world renowned pandemic expert, Yanir Baryam, who joined us, who joined me on these advocacy, advocacy calls to state um, this person is, is offering you a solution and I'm a physicist. I come from an academic institution that I run that has studied this strongly. And that way when coming to my leadership, I had a really powerful tool. I was being backed up by an expert saying we, we can do better. Um, I was very grateful to have some trainings through N coronavirus, including a training on advocacy work that really set up an expectation for a slow process. Um, even though I really wanted a fast return, even though N coronavirus is teaching is that we could actually solve this quite swiftly, like a month, two month situation. Um, and community advocacy is slow. So getting ready to make a commitment for an ongoing effort um, has been huge. Over time, I was struggling to get more team together. I felt very alone in my community, reaching out and doing this advocacy work and picking up a team member. And Yanir suggested that I might need a connector, somebody who was really gonna just aggressively connect um, that person happens to be a family member and also an oxygen user, another driver here, it's my mom. Um, and uh, from there, we were working together, able to recruit a team of local volunteers, primarily seniors who have some extra availability, who are not caring for children, but not totally. We have some representatives from the nonprofit sector who are on the clock showing up to these meetings. Um, we're about um, a core of nine. We instituted a weekly meeting. It's an opportunity that anybody new can come engage with our group. Um, for a very long time, we were solely outreach focused. Um, we had a little pause for the election because so many people's bandwidth were sucked up by other commitments. When we resumed, we really came in with a focus to take on a project-based approach. Um, this has been instrumental in moving our group forward a little bit more in terms of getting a much stronger grounding for um, be, yeah. being able to assert ourselves into the conversation um, as part of the solution, as part of the people who are doing things, not just talking about things. Um, it's been, uh, there have been some extreme periods of frustration and some really amazing victories as well. And I would love to support anybody who is interested in getting involved with this work ongoing, help you to make that long-term commitment as I've had the support of all of my coworkers and coronavirus until you can find your local team. Um, and as Vicki stated, every individual can actually be the person who stands up and starts to take action, even if you're a team of one. Um, I, I would like to reflect on one and coronavirus volunteer who's done a continuous letter campaign. And now Yanir and he are able to meet with some health administrators at a national level. Okay, this is a team of one many months of work and it produced an amazing outreach meeting. So um, I, I really thank you for being here. It's the first major step. We're a community. We're here to support you. And um, I would like to let the next speaker go. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Briggs. That was, that was great to hear from you and very inspiring. Um, I like to move on to Tiffany James, our our star volunteer from South Carolina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Tiffany James um, from Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I have a background in um, political campaigning, um, also um, public administration and community outreach and community engagement. Um, so I've worked in different sectors, um, including um, transportation um, and the arts. And now I'm working in public health um, you know, trying to get to zero um, with COVID. So um, I really love working in the community and getting the community involved in issues that matter to them and issues that will um, bring them a better quality of life. And so right now there was no other issue that was more important to me um, than um, 
you know, getting to zero with, with COVID-19. So um, I've been working with in coronavirus um, since May of this year, of last year. And um, I've been honored to do the work with in coronavirus. Um, I had wonderful guides um, to basically give me the confidence to um, speak about this topic, something that is not in my, not in my, um, in my experience. Um, I have Yanir um, Baryam who has been just tremendous with um, being available. Um, so just anytime I call, um, anytime I email or text, he is always there to provide either advice, um, suggestions, um, and to speak to people um, you know, further in depth about coronavirus and um, about his experience um, dealing with pandemics around the world and also talking about um, why it's necessary for us to get to zero um, with COVID. So I'm so grateful for um, his leadership, so grateful for the support that I've had from in coronavirus with Katie and Briggs and, and Gary and um, just, uh, Joaquim, so many people who show up. Um, we have panel discussions in um, Columbia, South Carolina, and um, they <clears throat> jump on a call um, to do a workshop. We have Natasha Poling from South Carolina on the on our Zoom um, today, and she's she works with the South Carolina Association for Community Partnerships, Community Action Partnerships. <laughs> and um, they had a workshop um, with a panel from in coronavirus with Yanir and um, Gary and Jeremy and, and Joshua Cohen and just so many people who dedicate their time to inform us of things that we don't get from TV, um, things that we don't get from the media, things that we don't get from um, our, our government. So um, it's you know, very refreshing to um, hear straight from scientists, straight from, um, you know, pandemic experts, straight from virologists and health officials and, um, and activists. Um, it's just, it's really refreshing to have all of that support um, while you're doing the work and I could not do it without them. So I'm just really grateful for that. Um, also the community members I mentioned, um, Natasha, she has been, um, just on the ground working and connecting us with um, other organizations that her organization is connected with. We had people sign up um, from um, different organizations because of a workshop or two workshops that she held with um, with um, SkyCap, <laughs> which is the acronym for her, the organization she's with. And um, she's just been tremendous. So I'm grateful for the support that she provides. We have so many other um, oh, she says in the chat that um, they're planning a third, which is wonderful. Um, we have so many other organizations um, partnered with us. Um, we call ourselves In Coronavirus South Carolina, and we're a coalition of different organizations across the state. Um, so we have about 20 organizations that partner with us who get information out for us and help us share information on um, social media. Um, the organizations, um, they range from government um, agencies, um, such as Fairfield County, the county that we started in in, um, in South Carolina. Um, and it also, um, it also has um, organ nonprofit organizations um, like SkyCap and um, Eat Smart Move More and um, Black Voters Matter and um, other Poor People's Campaign, um, Barnstormers for America. Um, so many different um, advocacy groups um, are a part of our coalition and we all put our minds together to come up with activity, um, to come up with content to reach out to the community. Um, so just the coalition is amazing. And I would like to say that um, Briggs situation was a little different than mine. Um, I. I think I started out with a whole lot of people um, involved, like a whole lot of organizations involved. Um, we were holding meetings and we would have um, a lot of people show up, but throughout the pandemic, um, 
I saw that there was COVID fatigue settling in and I could actually see it happening. And so people started just, you know, finding other things to get involved in and weaving themselves back into what we're doing and then they'll disappear. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was really hard keeping the uh, retention of the people who got involved uh, because frankly, they see their friends on social media going to the beach getting on the airplane, doing all this stuff, and then they start doing it. And they're kind of not involved anymore because they're just tired, right? Um, but we um, still have a great group. Um, we're still going strong. We're still getting new partnerships. And um, and thankfully, some of the people come back. So um, I don't think it's a lost cause. I think that, you know, it's human nature. Sometimes people just um, you know, when you're working on an issue that you've never worked on before, there's nobody in modern times who's organized around a pandemic in the United States, right? Um, and, and in a lot of, in, in many parts of the world, this is something that is um, new. So, um, so yeah, it, it's challenging, um, but it's very rewarding and it's very much needed. And I guess the advice that I would give, well, yes. The mm -hmm. advice that I will give is to not be caught up in the result and just do the work. Just do the work and um, you won't um, get let down by any expectations that you set for yourself in the work that you do. Um, you won't get let down by expectations that you put on others. Um, if you just focus on what you're doing, focus on connecting and partnerships and, um, and doing the action steps and do not get hung up on the results because that can really, um, that can, that can contribute to COVID fatigue too. And it happened to me. So <laughs> things not um, coming out the way that I wanted it to. And I was just like, you know what? Um, it's about just doing the work because we are making an impact on you know so many people's lives even people that we cannot even um that we don't even know so we just have to um keep it moving um uh some of the things that we've done uh we have partnered with um, Fairfield County Administration um they provided an isolation home for people who are not able to isolate outside of their um outside of their homes um we have um HIPAA trained um, volunteers who have been calling um, church members to um, get their symptoms and to check on them. Um, we have have people doing some mutual aid um, work, providing people with some um, some um, basic needs that they um, that they lack. Um, so we have people just providing resources to people. Uh, we have people. Um, advising people of testing um, centers in their, um, in their areas. Um, and we just have so many other, other um, activities that we're doing. We're um, going from most of our focus being on the community building and pushing it towards advocacy because we really need our government officials to step up. Uh, in order for us to get the community work um, done that we need, we need our government to step up. So we're really pushing towards um, letter writing campaigns. And um, one more thing before I um, before I finish, um, we are having a series of um, uh, community service events um, around the Martin Luther King birthday. So on the 16th, 17th and 18th, we're having a series of events. They're all virtual um, and it will be sponsored by um, in coronavirus and the COVID action group. And um, it's in partnership with the Biden inaugural committee. Um, so um, the mobilized link I'll put in the chat. Um, and, and so you can kind of see and you can sign up if you would like, because even though um, it's a South Carolina event, people from all over the nation are signing up for it. So um, the, the first event, we got the link for and we're still waiting for approval for the, sec the other two events. But that's my um, story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and I hope you all stick to it with me. And I am more than happy to help um, guide anyone and give any advice or any inspiration to anyone.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We love Thank hearing you. you. You have great energy <laughs> and you'll be a great mentor. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, I'd like to hear from Joaquin Beltran in, uh, from Los Angeles, California, um, maker of Speak Up America and uh, newly uh, the Green Zone Act. So Joaquin, take it away. Hey, um, hi everyone. Um, good to see your beautiful faces, all energized, ready to go. Um, so um, I'm from Los Angeles. Um, I have my um, star background here. I uh, forgot to change that, but it's a good background. So I'm glad it's, uh, it, it's uh, safe for work and, uh, and uh, <laughs> cosmic. Um, so my background is in politics. Um, it, I worked on uh, the Obama campaign in 2008. Uh, I recently um, worked on the Biden-Harris campaign uh, as a GOTV regional director um, in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, and um, so, you know, uh, early in the pandemic, January, I saw, you know, the news coming out of, um, out of China, looked like a big deal. Um, you know, during February, I'm like, hey, why isn't the government acting, right? Like, you know, it's, it's blowing up in China, it's blowing up in, it, uh, in Iran, it's blowing up in Italy, right? Like, once this is here, it's gonna get out of control. So uh, finally, um, in uh, late February, um, you know, I decided that, hey, you know, I can't wait for government to do what they're supposed to do. I have to do whatever I can, right? Um, so, um, you know, so in, in that moment, you know, I just started sharing information publicly with my own networks. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I guess there's another voice on there. Um, so, you know, just pushing out information, trying to, you know, uh, help people be safe. Um, and, um, you know, my, my previous background is in advocacy as well. Um, I advocated for higher education, for economic development. Um, and so um, a friend, uh, Kevin Shire, um, he, he's um, a director for the uh, National Science Volunteer Database. Um, he told me, hey, um, and coronavirus um, is doing work that, you know, obviously you're already, you know, trying to do. So why don't you come and see how you can, uh, you know, work with them and, um, you know, and, and help work on this pandemic. Um, so I got in um, and really I, I saw the need um, as far as advocacy and my goal uh, was to try to empower as many people to take action uh, across the United States, right? Um, so one of the ways I did that was um, through Speak Up America. I set up a, a campaign on there so that people would have um, automated calls to their elected officials. Um, so mayors, governors, uh, Congress, right? We did some special campaigns too uh, for South Carolina, for their state legislature, uh, as well as Virginia. Um, and then also um, uh, I did a training um, with my advocacy background um, to help um, anyone uh, who was interested in, in taking action uh, to understand how the process works, right? To understand how to speak with elected officials, to understand how to get those meetings, to understand how to have effective meetings uh, once they have them, right? Um, and, and sort of, you know, what to expect in that process. Um, and so um, also, you know, did different information on videos with Yanir, uh, with uh, Jeremy Rossman, um, you know, with different people who can share um, essentially what government should be doing. It's, you know, this is a public educational campaign. <laughs> hey, this is how the virus works, right? These are things we could do um, to help end the pandemic, right? Um, and just get that out there. Um, and so, um, you know, what I've been doing now is um, um, I, uh, I founded and authored a Green Zone Act, uh, greenzoneact.com, uh, which is federal legislation um, to, um, that includes protection protocols, financial foundation and community care uh, to end community transmission of the pandemic, right? So, you know, uh, it's December, right? Um, th th this was last month, right? So it's December, we're at 300,000 cases. I'm really frustrated. And, you know, I, I decided to take my background in politics, advocacy, 
you know, every, um, you know, community action that I've been involved with in the past and say, hey, how can we accelerate this? So I decided to, um, you know, just um, work on a Green Zone Act uh, to accelerate action on the pandemic. Um, and um, we had some great uh, progress on that. Michael Osterholm, who's uh, part of the COVID task force uh, for the Biden-Harris administration or, um, you know, uh, elect uh, administration, uh, forwarded it on to the transition team. Um, so there's great progress there, forwarding on to um, other elected officials to try to get traction there. Um, and so, you know, part of the, the plan to develop this is, you know, uh, growing social media presence. Um, at the core of it is really organizing, right? It's really taking my organizing background and, and integrating it into this um, national campaign um, and advocacy, right? So if you'd like to be involved in any way, um, Katie shared the link, um, I believe, greenzoneact.com. Uh, please, uh, you know, uh, please read it over. Uh, please sign it if you support it, um, and please share it. Um, you know, part, part of the part of the um, um, the challenge with any initiative, uh, right, um, is just um, you know when you get started, um, it takes time to to grow, right? And so that's part of the patience piece that you know people were talking about, like like Briggs and Tiffany were talking about. Um, it just takes time, right? So if you're working on something, right? Just get started, you know, put it out there. Um, and whoever's interested, you know, uh, will, um, you know, will get involved or, or will ask questions or whatever the case, right? Uh, but just be patient, you know, some of these things take time, right? So there, it's kind of like a, it's an interesting dynamic, right? Like, because I know for myself, I'm like, why isn't this solved? This should be solved already, right? And so I'm doing everything I can. But at the same time, there's a dynamic where you have to be patient, right? Where you have to say, okay, you know, thing, things are just going to uh, roll out the way they're going to roll out. But at the same time, for myself, I'm going to do everything I can, right, to push things forward um, as quickly as possible. So uh, I'm happy to to help in any any way, um, answer any questions. Um, and you know, this is a great group to be a part of. Um, Katie, Vicky, Tiffany, uh, Briggs, uh, Yanir, um, Gary, uh, Jeremy. I don't I don't know if he's on the call. Uh, Michelle and Eric are doing a, a amazing work too with Make Good Together. Um, you know, so, so many great people, uh, uh, such a great resource here. So, um, you know, lean on us if you uh, need any help. Uh, we're here to, uh, to help you be successful. Thank you so much, Joaquin. You said it so well. We have a great supportive team. We've been together for 10 months. Uh, keeping each other company, supporting each other um, day in, day out. We're open 365 days a year. And um, I'd like to turn over the floor to our wonderful friends, Michelle and Eric from Chicago, uh, Make Good Together. They have been doing an amazing job spreading uh, individual action and empowering people um, to make uh, safe choices um, in a climate, in a social climate that isn't so easy to navigate. So I find their, their work uh, helpful to me and helpful to, to all of us. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to them now. Uh, thanks guys. Thanks Katie. So I am Michelle and this I'm is Eric. Eric. Yep. Um, so we have an extensive background in advocacy and um, activism. Actually, no, we don't. We have zero background in advocacy and activism. It's new to us. It's, it's this new territory that we have never been a part of, which I think kind of speaks to the importance of just everyday people rolling up their sleeves and doing what they have to do. It's, it's going to take everyone's participation to really put a dent in this thing. So Eric and I, um, you know, we're always doing our part as far as safety protocols, wearing our masks, we stay at home a lot, like all those things that we're told to do. Um, but still, we weren't finding a lot of leadership, um, just what should we do above and beyond just following these protocols. And instead of waiting, we just decided to start a movement that's really aimed at empowering other people to be leaders. 
um, to tackle, you know, this pandemic, specifically around the context of social circles. So where we found um, our personal our, uh, troubles with like doing the right thing as far as wearing a mask and, you know, not going to parties and such, it was a dilemma for us when our friends and our family asked us to engage in situations that were unsafe. So like when my mom asked me, let's say to come home for Thanksgiving, like that, that's a conundrum. Like, what do you do in that situation? So our group really kind of focuses on those social dynamics where we kind of feel like we can break the rules because it's for my mom, it's for my friends. I don't want to look bad. I don't want people to think that I don't care by um, turning down an invitation or you know, saying, no, I can't hug you. Um, so at the, at the core of what we do, it's, it's um, there's this pr uh, promise certificate and it simply says, I, so I, Michelle Lukasik, promise to be a leader within my social circle to annihilate COVID-19. And that's been kind of the main driving component of our campaign. And it's been pretty awesome. Um, We've gotten uh, just this m beginning of this month, I think over 100 people like actually signing this promise certificate. And it feels like um, people are really using it as an accountability tool. So now when they think about maybe saying yes to an invitation that they know in their heart, they shouldn't be you know, in proximity with other people, they think twice about it. Um, and also it, um, it gives people like this empowerment to be able to do the right thing. Yeah, um, I would say accountability plus influence. So the, the whole idea behind um, uh, what you call the pledge or our promise certificate is um, to, to get uh, to influence or empower as many people as you can at an individual level um, just to, to sign their name, you know, and, um, and then share it with as many people as, um, they can. And we've been working on social media doing this and, um, we feel that it's a way to reaffirm, especially with, uh, COVID fatigue going on that, um, you know, one, it's, it's not over yet. And, and two, it's, you know, um, th there's going to be a lot of challenges in a social situations. And that's what we foresaw where we're going to be willing to bend the rules, but, you know, um, the science is, you know, pretty, um, it's, it's either, you know, going to be one way or the other. So it's a way to, to get people united and to spread that positive influence. We have so much influence and I think we don't always realize that, but people are always watching. Um, our influence spreads so much further than, than we ever think. So it's important that we are doing the right things in every situation, including those that are difficult um, as far as friends and family groups. So um, makegoodtogether.com is the our website. You can grab the promise certificate there if you want to take part in that campaign. Instagram is our, kind of our primary vehicle for kind of what we're doing on social media. So feel free to, to uh, check out at makegoodtogether on Instagram as well. Um, thanks to N Coronavirus and Zero COVID Alliance. Um, super awesome resource, like for bringing a whole bunch of dis different disciplines and like-minded people together to tackle this enormous issue that we're all facing right now. So yeah. much appreciation and love to everybody who's doing the, doing the hard work. Thank you. And feel free to, um, to share our content as, you know, as much as you can. Um, the promise certificate um, is pretty easy to do either on Instagram or our website and good, good together .com. Um, you could print it out if you have a printer take a photo of it with your name and share it on social media um, or you could you could do it all digitally um, 
and Michelle also has a Michelle has a, a background in graphic design, which has helped this group tremendously. So she'll also um, kind of like do your own customized design uh, with a promise. And yeah. And I just see Katie's note about graphic design. So I think I think a key component of like just individual action is like no matter what you're good at there's a there's a piece of what you are good at that has a critical role that is so important i mean when the pandemic started i would have never thought that like my background in brand strategy and communication strategy would have been anything helpful for this but like every single thing that every talent that we have every strength that we have can be used in some way we just have to you know, be willing to roll up our sleeves and, and take on that on that challenge, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that is such a great way to, 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 to roll up our, uh, to, to wind up our the end of the presentations here. Um, whatever your talent is, whatever your specialty is, it can be leveraged to make a difference. And I've just been so impressed by, by Michelle and Eric's projects. Their social media has been inspiring and really great to communicate with and I've learned and it's helped us put our message forward um, and everyone has their their unique skills and talent and together um, we we can get this this done so I'm going to open up now um, the, the Q&A thank you Michelle and, and Eric I'm going to open up to anyone here on the call that is new that would like to ask um, any of us a question about how to get started or what brought them here or what hopes they have for their community totally open floor so we're a friendly we're a friendly group there are no silly questions um, we just we just want to help and have you feel comfortable so please anyone who's interested or has thought about making um, a change in their community um, Please feel free to unmute and um, share your video if you feel comfortable. So if no one else goes, um, my name is Gabi. I am in Switzerland and I have been, I have already started with some other people here to, um, try to do something about the situation in the schools because there is like a compulsory class attendance and even children at risk and parents at risk can't stay, can't keep the children at home. Um, and so I'm here to see if I take some good ideas because we are just starting, but we're looking for how we can progress. There have been other groups in Europe and we also have been trying to learn from them. But yeah, I am very happy to hear, and I think I will probably reach out to some of you for taking ideas, if I may. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, schools, um, the issue of schools comes up a lot, and it is definitely a challenge. Um, yeah, it is really tough. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Your, your concern is shared by many, and uh, we do have some other groups that discuss this this topic as well. So we'll be sure to invite you to our international call um, on Thursdays. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. My name is Angelo Leidens. I am from the Dutch Caribbean, Curacao. Um, initially, I, uh, as soon as end coronavirus started, I got involved. Um, I haven't been active very much with the end coronavirus um, um, movement, but I have been very active locally. I'm also a scientist. I like to uh, study the complexity science uh, sciences. Um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of work in that for my island, um, what I call a small island state, not a small a small uh, a small island development state. <laughs> um, my, I have a question actually because um, I've been doing a lot of study, um, a lot of research in some other alternatives to cure coronavirus. Um, one of them is uh, chlorine dioxide, which has been used. Uh, there is a lot of um, um, 
or he say that um, uh, anecdote, um, uh, evidence, anecdotal evidence about how it uh, cures um, coronavirus in three days by oxidation, oxidizing the um, uh, corona of the virus, and also provide uh, oxygen to the body that allows your body to become more um, alkaline and thus create an environment that prevents the um, prevents the um, uh, uh, corona from affecting you again. There's and a lot of- can, from... I, I apologize, but this is one topic that we are very careful about uh, not uh, creating an opportunity for, um, uh, that we are advocating uh, particular cures because there's so much opportunity for misunderstanding and, and, and lack of, of clarity. Um, and so we really have to have that bubble up through the, you know, opportunities. If there's evidence for it, then it has to be vetted and it has to become more widely adopted through that process rather than through an advocacy process. Um, okay. Our, our focus is on uh, making sure that, um, that the social actions that are taken are leading to better outcomes. And one of them can be advocating for the opportunity for there to be more evaluation of new uh, opportunities for care. Um, and, and we've done that over time, but we cannot be about a particular uh, opportunity because we don't know which ones will end up being the right ones. Okay. Um, um, in any case, I'm, I'm speaking from uh, at least uh, um, 5,000 uh, researchers and uh, um, doctors about it. I'm not going to go further on that. Um, you mentioned advocating in terms of a particular cure or particular, um, um, for instance, uh, um, somebody mentioned earlier that um, of uh, COVID fatigue. We are also studying long COVID, uh, which is after you are um, affected, uh, after you have uh, cured, that um, you still have symptoms. And how do you deal with those symptoms? We are doing also research on that. Is that something that is within this? Yeah, so the research part of it, everything is good. And you know, sharing that information, we're all in favor. Uh, it's just a question, as I mentioned, it's only a question of the, you know, advocating for particular cures. That has to come from the evidence and not from the uh, articulation of a, of a simple uh -huh. I'm, I'm not I'm not advocating uh, it, but um, again, I'm coming from evidence uh, scientifically. And um, um, the question then is to what's the process in getting you informed about it? And also, um, I, I'm doing my part as a citizen, a global, global citizen, informing you that this is uh, available and and that um, to what extent um, you are aware of it. That's what, yeah, what so I'm we doing have, we, we do have people who are who devote time to uh, looking at the literature and understanding what's going on and, and bringing it to the attention. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Angelo. All right. Um, someone else. I have a question. Please. I wanted to ask about, um, hi, <laughs> I wanted to ask about humidifiers. Can you guys tell us um, how they work in conjunction with air purifiers and whether or not there's one that's recommended? So I don't know if that's a question for this meeting uh, because it's an organizational meeting, but the quick answer is humidifiers are fine with air purifiers. They do something different. Uh, mm -hmm. And both are recommended during the winter when the air is dry. Okay, I was I was finding out because I need to send that notification to our offices, and I just found out about it. Apparently, it's been out for a while, and I didn't know. Yeah. So it, it is worthwhile to use humidifiers when it, the air is dry, so that it, your membranes of your nose don't dry up, and um, and having the air purification is separately a good thing to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I, I see a hand raised from Thomas. Yeah, hi, I'm Thomas Blomstedt Christensen. I'm from Denmark. And uh, I have a question here to this uh, global community and thanks for all your great work. And that is, how do you convince 
authorities that are thinking things are going well, that it's actually heading in the wrong direction. As you might know, uh, Yanira, I, I follow you on Twitter and see your uh, daily updates, and you have spotted that it's not going as well in Denmark at, as it was at a time. But the impression with the Danish authorities is that, well, it's basically going all right, and the current level of intervention would just add some more interventions and they will be fine. But that's not my interpretation, and I don't think that's the same here. So that's my general question. Are there any global kind of um, advice on how to approach authorities and, and the government to make them understand that their approach is not sufficient? Um, Briggs, do you want to take that? Go ahead. Sure. I'm uh, happy to just make a comment on this. Um, part of the work that happens with my team is we discuss a lot about the breakdowns that are occurring. Okay. Um, and say we're trying to get in and fix these somehow, um, address these, draw attention to them, draw attention to the people who should be doing the work, um, close some gaps there around visibility for the breakdowns. Um, but from an individual activist standpoint, it's very important to remember that you need to find the people who you can work with and not worry about the people who you can't work with. Because until you have more team, you're not gonna be able to move a politician forward. Um, now what's happening in, in, our, in my locality is our, we're trying to get really get our messaging in with our county board of supervisors. This is the uh, government entity that runs our local health department. Um, and uh, pushing that message upward into our political through constituent representatives. So now we're not just me and Yanir going, we're saying we have people who, who are elected you, who are living in these neighborhoods, bringing these issues forward to you. Um, it's so it's about finding your collaborators in the community first. Um, anybody can continue to do the outreach to their representatives at a local state or national level um, and should and should encourage their community to and finding your group of people who are saying that together is much more powerful. Um, a, a great lesson I've learned from and coronavirus is that politicians don't lead. They go where their people are standing. So you need to get your people to stand up um, and that's, that's us, that's us, we are the people, that's us, that's us by being here at this meeting and, and, and doing what you need to do to start having more conversations. It's uh, that this work starts strongly in conversation. Say, say, we're gonna identify this problem. We're gonna, we didn't make this problem, but we're gonna identify this problem. We're gonna be the adults in the room. We're gonna be the ones who start to clean up this problem. Um, from, from, uh, I, I, lo I love this emphasis on skill set matching, like, uh, you, you can do what you can do. It's, it's, you can't take the burden of the whole pandemic upon yourself, but you can do what you can do. You can find that one friend who really cares and say, we're going to start a meeting. We're going to start a community conversation about this, that something's wrong. Um, then from there with your yes people, you can be more contrary. <laughs> Thank you. I would love to hear about some other, some from other panelists who are interacting with their uh, local politicians. <laughs> I can add something, um, oh. and, and and that is that. Um, look, po politics is a complicated thing by it, by its nature, because the politician um, has many constituents with a lot of you know diverse interests, right? And so you are one of those, right? Now. Right in, in our mind, it's like, hey, it's obvious, right? The pandemic affects everyone and the pandemic, everyone benefits, right? But then, you know, there's a lot of input coming into their office, you know? Um, and so now um, you have to provide them um, sort of the, um, um, so, sort of the, um, enough of a of support enough of a base enough voices for them to say hey i have enough support from my constituents in order to do this right that you're asking right um 
uh, otherwise, you know, um, there may be some other groups or, you know, constituents um, who have more, um, you know, people, right? And more support, right? And so, you know, they're saying, you know, you know, Thomas has a good idea here, but like most of the people that I represent want this other thing, right? And so that's where you, you know, have to, um, you know, ex expand that group and, and make sure you are being consistent, uh, speaking to them on a, on a regular basis, uh, making sure that your issue is front and center, right? Um, and, and, and try different approaches, try different angles, right? Um, try the same thing over and over again, right? Um, and, and so eventually, um, at some point, um, you know, s something will click, right? Um, it could be fast, it, it could take time, right? Um, but, but this direct action is, is really important um, to try to get them to change. May I kind of follow up or just inject something here, which is uh, there's a special problem here, which might also be global. I think, Yanir, you, you have been uh, bringing this forward too, which is like, there's a political side to it, and then there's an epistemic side, which is there are certain things that the Danish health authorities that are advising the Danish government, they are not recognizing. For instance, aerosol spread of this disease. They're not, they're not acknowledging that it's not influenza-like, but it's a, it's a SARS kind of disease. So it's like there's also this thing about the politicians not willing to, or they, they are kind of depending on the advice getting from their trusted advisors, but some of that advice is wrong. Uh, so there's that kind of interface too. And are there any uh, also global uh, kind of uh, uh, ideas about how to kind of wedge yourself in between the politicians and these advisors or these health authorities that haven't understood the, the, the complete uh, um, and have, don't have a comprehensive understanding of this disease. I think we're making the wrong arguments, in all honesty. Um, one of my degrees is in political science. And one thing that I know is that you have to find something that politicians all care about. And politicians all care about money. The economy, the economy, the economy. Those are the three things they care about. And that's something that's in common across the board. So if you can show them how this is having an economic impact, they'll continually listen to what you have to say. Um, the next meeting that we're actually planning to do is going to focus on that. And we're inviting politicians specifically. We'll, we'll be inviting you all as well. But um, they need to hear from voices of people who are saying, not only is there a coronavirus, but if we stopped it soon, this would be the economic impact. If we stop it late, this will be the economic impact. And here's what's happening on the ground now. Here's what's increasing poverty. Here's what's doing this. Here's what's doing that. Our organization specifically geared toward trying to stop and end poverty in the United States, but it's actually increasing under COVID. And that's something they have to hear. So if we can get more experts who can talk about the economics of the situation to politicians across the world, they will listen. Stop making COVID arguments, start making economic ones. They'll hear you. Thank you, Natasha. That That is actually very, very helpful and insightful. And we have- to that just really quickly, um, Natasha um, is right. Um, money is what a lot of politicians care about. Um, and I was going to say, um, one of the things you can do to target politicians to get their, um, to get them involved is, and to get their attention is to look for the gatekeeper, um, the gatekeeper of the neighborhoods, that's who they listen to. And also the ones who influence them. So you may not be able to get the politician, but who's that politician that, I mean, who's that person that's in their circle that influences them? Find out who that is, influence that person, and they will get their network of people together to get to that politician. Um, one of the networks that we have in Columbia is um, Save Dieting SC. And they, they're a coalition of restaurants who got together um, during COVID um, to basically share information about um, COVID safety because they weren't getting great direction from our state. So um, we um, were able, Incredivirus was able to, um, you know, consult um, in the National Science 
Sciences database, was able to consult um, these uh, restaurant owners um, throughout the pandemic. And they were very grateful for the information that they received. Also, these restaurant owners are very close to our mayor, right? And so um, though the mayor calls me his little sister, I don't have money. So <laughs> um, he's gonna listen to those restaurant owners who basically bring the money into the city. So they are basically um, going to have a workshop for us to invite the politicians in to, um, to listen to our experts from in coronavirus. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Did I see that uh, Murto was trying to make comment earlier? I wanted to make sure to include you. Thanks, Briggs, for looking out. Murto, are you on? Um, hi, yes, I'm on. I, I just I ended join join late because I just saw it like at 9:45. But um, yeah, I wanted to say something about. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking of organizing through Facebook, finding the people, maybe trying to describe the ways in which we are uh, scuttling the economy by staying home. Like personally, I will barely go shopping anymore. Uh, certainly have canceled any kind of construction in my house and so on. And those are maybe some of the economic impacts that we can show locally and that I'm in Marin County. So we are totally excited that we're doing so well, but we're not, our hospitals are full. So it's California after all. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, scratching my head how it is that we could get our message through that, of course, the solution is to fix this and not to continue to have a low level. But from the beginning of the pandemic, our local public health people have been talking about uh, control, uh, you know, flattening the curve, having a low level of coronavirus, just keeping going through the population, opening the schools on and on. So basically, I'm, um, I'm scratching, I'm here scratching my head. Um, we're listening to you guys to try to see what is going on elsewhere, what might have worked, um, because I don't see it here. I think that social media is a wonderful and powerful tool. Um, and I've also found for myself, it hasn't been the thing that's helped me catalyze my team. I made those connections through personal connections in order to get into that team setting. And then we have a goal to get social media going as a team, but that's not one of our skill sets that we've got at the table yet. Um, so it hasn't truly activated. Um, I, I, I really encourage you to find your team members. It's so empowering. First of all, you did. You came to this meeting and we're your team. Um, and until you can have a great local team members, you can participate with this community. We have a lot of tools to support that ongoing stability. Um, there's a daily call Monday through Thursday that's um, like uh, people do project updates as well as um, we talk about what's going on at a global level and nationally with the virus. Um, and then we have a couple of other weekly calls scattered across our week. Um, and getting engaged with a team and knowing that you're not doing this work by yourself is huge. Um, and, and, and then coming with your ideas and people can say, this is what's worked for me, this didn't work, um, and have that continuous support uh, is huge, is huge. So, I, um, but, but I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to find your local support person, whether it's the person you live with or a family member, um, an old work colleague. There are other people who care passionately and are tired of just doing safety measures for themselves to stop the pandemic. The next action is to start doing social action around this. Um, so um, I, I just want to really extend an invitation that you are part of our team if you want to take on this work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. No, I think that the uh, we have a coronavirus and Marin Facebook group that has hundreds of people and have been contributing to it for the last several months. So I think that actually that is a leverageable or whatever a place where I can find people. I know what the people are thinking on that group pretty well. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I, my, my personal friends, to be honest, are spread out around the Bay Area. And many of them are uh, whining without really being constructive about it. So I am not sure actually that because 
even if I wanted to reach out to, let's say, my board of supervisors, I'd have to find people in my county. And you would be surprised that my friends are not here. Um, however that worked out, they're not here. So I think that anyway, that is, and also the next door group might be another place where people might start to reach out locally. I like the idea of creating a safe zone, you know, the way that I've been reading about. And I think that something like Marin, I mean, we have a little bit of that exclusionary attitude already, and maybe we could make use of that for once instead of having it be a negative thing um, to try and spread some safety throughout the Bay Area. But yeah, I will, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll keep uh, maybe joining some more meetings to see what else has worked for you guys um, in terms of, this is international, it's pretty exciting. And also I think that the new variant is an opportunity to say, you know, worse is coming. You guys don't like what you're seeing now. Worse is coming. Now's the time to go to zero COVID. The vaccination, I mean, in Israel today, I was reading that they're, they're thinking in Israel, which is the only country doing halfway well with vaccination, that they're gonna be done in April. And that's ridiculous. We won't be done until April of 2022, the way we're going. So I, thank you, um, Marta. I don't know how much more time folks have uh, dedicated uh, to be on this call with us. There were a couple of other people that raised their hands or sent me a message uh, that wanted to speak and um, perhaps you near wanted to say a couple of words, but I do realize we are, we are past the hour. Um, I would like to bring everyone's attention to how to stay in touch with us. I put in the chat um, our different links to social media. I put my email address, katie at nexi.edu a few times. And also I put a Zoom link. We meet every single evening, 6 p.m. Uh, California time, 9 p.m. Eastern time um, every night. Um, so you can come see me, Briggs, Joaquin, Yanir, um, Sarah, Gary, um, and Vicky sometimes that, that at that hour she is international. We also have an international call um, at 2 p.m. Eastern time on Thursdays. Um, there are plenty of opportunities um, to continue the conversation. Um, I think that time is on, on Wednesday, the international call. But, uh, oh, thank you for the correction. Yes, okay, Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern time is the international call. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, and Rami did put, um, look out for Rami's link in the chat. He put the Zoom link for the international call. I put the Zoom link for the daily call. Yeah. And, so um, and there is the Slack channel where people can join uh, if you're comfortable doing that. And again, more directly emailing people also works. Um, and um, uh, in terms of the general comments, there are questions and maybe we can uh, uh, address those questions, but maybe we can bring the call to a close. Um, uh, but uh, uh, one comment that I would make again is to reinforce that um, we are facing a huge challenge, obviously, and the fact that uh, governance systems around the world are not doing the right thing really means that um, it really has to, a lot of the effort has to be uh, bottom up and, and everyone should be involved. And even if it was uh, more top down, it's always still addressing a pandemic is always still about galvanizing uh, everyone to do things that are going to be uh, stopping the outbreak. So putting us all together uh, and taking action is, is super important. And if it would be helpful for us to run another session, um, if you guys would like to come back and continue the conversation, um, you know, please raise your hand or put a note in the chat, and we can set up, you know, another another Zoom meeting with the same with the same folks. So we are here to support you. We are flexible. Um, we are around the clock. <laughs> we are around the world, um, and uh, we are dedicated, um, and we are a great support to each other. Um, and we would love. Um, new members to join in with like-minded um, goals. So I thank everyone so much for your time. This meeting was recorded and will be available on um, our Nexi YouTube channel. Um, so you guys can review it again. Um, again, I hope you all caught my, my email address. Please do not hesitate to reach out. There are no silly questions. Um, it's a hard time and we are, I'm happy to, to help. We're all happy to help each other. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, all right, I'll stay on the call for a few more minutes. Um,
if anyone you know wants to ask any questions one on one. Um, but otherwise, you all have a great day and thanks for visiting. I'm also happy to hang out for a little while for anybody who'd like to discuss the community work a little more. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Briggs, for helping today. Thanks, Tiffany. Tiffany is also going to stay on. Yeah, I'll also still, uh, I will stay for. Yeah, so the, men well. the mentors will stay on if anyone would like to connect one on one. Pick your mentor, <laughs> ask your questions. <laughs> I, I can also stay on if anyone wants any resources or is looking for any resources of any type. Sorry, I joined late. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Sarah is our is our number one find it resource at, uh, find, if it's out there, she'll find it. So if you have a question, she'll get the answer. And I also have a lot of, of resources for local, like depending on your locality, uh, like what's going on in your area, other groups in your area that might be of use to you and that you might join etc. Great. I'm drinking my water Briggs. It's Tuesday. It's a good day to drink water. Yep. <laughs> the giant mug of water. Holy crap. My friend got me this awesome, insanely large uh, mug of, it keeps it cold all day. <laughs> I would um, be really love to hear from anybody who's um, new on this call, who would like to introduce themselves. Maybe you're already involved in local work or been taking actions. Um, I'd just love to hear more about the people who've joined us today in this open time and get that community feeling moving. <laughs> sure, hi, hi Briggs, hi Katie. Uh, I'm Randy, uh, Randy True, I joined late. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area. And uh, I run a public benefit corporation that's uh, focused on uh, scaling ultra low cost uh, accessible testing. And I got connected through um, Kevin at the, at the, um, at the, the uh, volunteer scientist database, um, who's also running uh, LAMP. And so I've, I've got very deep into the, the molecular diagnostics testing world. I used to run a startup in the space, but was actually, um, uh, running a, a STEM education nonprofit when the crisis hit, and I was uh, the school I was teaching at. I was teaching at a vocational high school. Uh, it, you know, it closed, and I pivoted my education work to focus on testing and have a have a uh, sort of focus and and um, special interest in helping our schools to open more safely with with low cost testing. And so, if there are other um, uh, sort of members of the the end crew in coronavirus oh, yeah. org group involved in testing and stuff, you know, feel free to connect me. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm working at both the high level and in, in sort of interacting with the uh, groups in the FDA on, on pathways to, to increase accessibility to validated low cost testing. And then I'm also working at, at the community and grassroots um, level in terms of bringing up surveillance, unregulated, currently unregulated surveillance testing and and supporting others in, in doing that, so. Randy, you should talk, we should, we should talk. Uh, uh, is, uh, who is that, Sarah? I'm Sarah, sorry. Okay, I have my video on because I'm, I'm using my phone and it kills my battery. But yeah, no, we should definitely talk about the, the surveillance, the testing, the schools, the opening school safely thing. Um, I have some projects going on with that. Um, and sure. it, if, you drop, if you drop your email into the chat, I'll just shoot you a, a note. Excellent. And actually, are you familiar with uh, rapidtest.org? Uh, I am. Um, I, you know, and I've worked with and collaborate with uh, Jeff Huber at Open COVID Screen. Um, oh yeah, they're also great. I, I haven't spoken with uh, Michael Minna or, or is it Chris that runs Rapid Test? Chris, yeah, I mean, Chris is, is, is kind of the main person who deals with organizing the group. Yeah, um, I, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to him uh, as yeah. well, I think. So I, think. I, I, I can set that up. Um, yeah, let's chat. I put my email, I sent my email to you in the chat. Great, I'm just copying. But yeah, I'd be super excited to talk to you about this. And, and I think there's some good connections that we can make. Awesome. Where are you based, Sarah? I'm in Portland, Oregon. Okay. I'm from Washington, DC though. <laughs> okay. If others end up having you know questions on, on related to testing at whatever level, technical or regulatory or logistical or philosophical, just let me know. <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm su super excited to have you on this call. Very, very excited to chat with you.
I can share a project around testing that my community coalition has been working on because we had a big success today. Um, we've really been trying to address the digital divide around testing. It's quite difficult to book a test if you don't have internet and things like ability to produce a QR code when showing up. We're also noticing um, like insurance firewalls are starting to occur, a major deterrent if you're not an insured person because you feel like you could possibly get a bill um, as warned by the firewall. Um, so uh, we've been working with our, our statewide um, hotline number, 211 number, to open up more phone booking pathways for testing. Um, really how to close that gap. And we did have a big victory today, which is that uh, the 211 administrators collaborated with the Arizona State University administrators who run something like 50 to 100 sites in Arizona. And now these operators at 211 are gonna be able to book tests through a backend mechanism so that these testing centers that are specifically set up in underserved communities can serve those communities by booking tests through phone, through a simple 211 phone number. Um, so that is a real example of how your community can start to make the harm reduction impact. This is giving us the power to be part of the conversation to say, we need a zero COVID strategy. And unt until you adopt it, you're not gonna figure out these problems. Uh, I was I was going to ask about. Um, I'm looking into doing something in a community. I talked to Sarah yesterday about um, starting maybe a mutual aid group or something, and um, I looked online and found that there's none in me village. So I'm just looking into uh, connecting with people that usually run a like a regular community group and seeing if they would be interested in this sort of thing. So if um, I mean, we, we went into uh, COVID lockdown yesterday nationally that's more restrictive than it has been before. Schools have closed and things. So if there's any um, information on, like, I was thinking about, like, connecting with uh, maybe, the, like, a community effort with schools to see if we can pick up on some of the slack that's left from, because I have family members in education and, and they talk about how, um, you know, there's going to be kids that are going home to like domestic abuse families and things. And so whether or not there's some sort of way that you can connect community groups to schools and, and to, to cope with the fallout of a lockdown without compromising, um, you know, the, the, the point of it, like, you know, not infecting uh, poor children that are vulnerable to that would be good at the same time. So if there's any information on that, I'd be really interested. Um, the, the, the school issue is just very, very complicated. Um, it gets debated within and coronavirus regularly. It comes up about these multiple needs that schools meet um, and versus the public health measures that we're recommending as the fastest route back to normal education setting, okay? Um, as long as we keep accommodating the virus, especially with the, there's going to be disrupted education. If we decide to deal with the virus fully, education can return to normal. So that's first is one, just again, the big banner thought. And then for, for my group, we, we, we did discuss schools a lot, um, looking at green zones because uh, like elementary school is so geographically centered. Um, uh, slightly tangential, what helped us was to zoom in on a focus group in one neighborhood. Um, and so instead of looking at our whole city, we said we're going to look at one underserved, economically disadvantaged neighborhood and find people who live in that neighborhood to be part of our team and talk about what's really happening for them. And by being armed with this very specific insights from the community for a while we were having a weekly focus group just to talk about this one neighborhood what's going on then we had the information to really say what's going on so i 
if you if you're looking to get involved in that work and you and there's not an organization that you're able to locate it's about what's going on in your neighborhood what's going on with the one school that you're looking at um how and and what what are we what how are we getting around this to understand because uh the, the the first half of our work was a huge amount of fact finding continuously like it's really easy to make assumptions but it's important to start with what's actually happening right now what's already happening um there's there's a lot of stuff happening but it's happening in a silo the communication isn't getting bridged right um Briggs is absolutely right um everything is in a silo um one of the things um, that we do and uh, we just we need to do it on a more consistent basis but we get um, organizations from across the state to get on a call and each organization talks about what they are doing to combat COVID whether it's mutual aid whether it's um, you know just public information um, or whether they're setting testing sites what have you and in that way there's not like a communication gap. Like everybody knows what organization is doing what. And if there's something missing, then um, we would know what to do to fill in the blank. Um, as far as schools um, are concerned, um, here in Columbia, there are two major school districts and um, they both have like their own thing going on. And um, I cannot even keep up with how they are operating. So um, one school district, um, they are like all virtual. And then like two weeks later, they're hybrid. And then like another week later, they are, you know, back in the school. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what's going on with that school district. And then the other school district on the other side of town, it's the same thing. So I actually, I just got so confused because each school district is on their own throughout our state. And they all have their own rules. And as soon as there there's a breakdown or a breakout, then they go to all high, I mean, all um, virtual. And then they say, oh, we're staying virtual for, you know, four weeks. We're going to clean out the school, da, da, da. And then it could be a hybrid. You can, you know, your kid can go to school or, you know, stay at home. And then it's like, oh, now you're, all your kids got to go to school. And it's like, I don't even see how the parents are doing it, really. I, I guess I just can't. <laughs> so I think like the only way to solve like the school issue for me and I think it's going to solve a lot of the issues is to have um a supported lockdown a supported lockdown where uh, parents are being paid to stay home and um kids are doing um their work from from home or from um areas that provide um wi-fi in their parking lots or what have you um because we have a lot of um, churches in rural areas that provide Wi-Fi um, in their parking lots because they know that the only structures they ha have out in the rural areas are the churches. And so they're like stepping up to provide Wi-Fi for um, families that do not have it. So, um, but yeah, I think the only way to like solve the school opening and reopening issue is just to have supported lockdown for five weeks get rid of the virus. And then that way we won't have to worry about, you know, if the school, you know, if there will be an outbreak at the school, you know, so supported lockdown and then also an exit strategy, which includes the green zone strategy. So that's, you know, that's my take on it. Yeah, that, that kind of gets to the supported lockdown thing is, is sort of what I, I wanted to address. That's great what you both said. Um, I was wondering about um, ways that I could maybe, um, you know, on a local level, look at what um, me and a few other people on a small scale can do kind of to, to support um, like school institutions as an example and like show maybe what you can do within um, restrictions without, um, without compromising uh, the the goal to to end COVID as quickly as possible. So that would be if like if there's any kind of practical uh, tips to um, or anything that you guys have already done um, on a local scale to support schools or or whether it is like um, Briggs was saying to to connect um, and uh, different people in community and schools and kind of be a bridge for information gathering and things. That, that was the sort of thing I would, I would get in at. Okay. It, it, only, oh, go ahead, Tiffany. Pardon. No, I was just going to say quickly, um, the only thing that um, we have done 
um, in regards to supporting schools um, is support them in their advocacy. So um, there is a group, there's a, a teacher's advocacy group here. Um, I think they're called Red for Ed. Um, and basically they, they do like protests. They do like drive, not drive through. Yeah, drive through protests. And so we participated in that. Um, and the protest was about, you know, um, they said virtual until safe. That was their campaign, virtual until safe. So we supported them in that campaign and, and worked with them on that. But now um, just like one of the leaders of that organization, she's so frustrated and so burnt out from fighting the school district. They are just, I mean, they, have to, they just have fatigue right now because they have to deal with their own children and their teachers themselves. And they are just really burnt out from, you know, doing the virtual teaching and the in-school teaching and, you know, um, juggling the same thing with their own children that they can't do the advocacy. Um, so, and I, I had someone actually email me and say that they, they do not have the capacity to do the advocacy anymore. Um, so, um, but we do support that group um, but that's the only thing we've done so far in regards to the schools. We would love to help you get started, Tom. Um, basically, yeah, we, that's what we're, we're inviting you to join our community so that we can support you ongoing with tips and tricks. Um, like Joaquin said, you might have to try a few times. You might have to try a few tactics. Um, we want to help you see yourself as an activist. Uh, for me, I found this work very confronting. I'm not a forward facing person um, other than my performance persona. So um, like getting involved with communicating with my government officials and, and putting myself out in my community that way, it's, it's a risk, right? It's new and confronting. We wanna support you and if your passion is this area of breakdown, I guarantee they need support solving the communication breakdowns. And, and that's kind of what our, our team has really come to learn that our role is to see these communication breakdowns, start to make a small impact, and then help our government to understand how to take on that role from our community org at a scalable level. Um, and, yeah, we want to support you. If you're thinking about taking this leap and transitioning from a person who's just tired of it to want, now you wanna do, we wanna help you and it's very confronting. And we uh, encourage you to be part of the community for support um, and get you rolling. I can't tell you how many one-on-ones I've had with Joaquin who has expertise, who's trained me to do this work how many people from the community looked at my documents, supported me in understanding what my talking points are. It's almost like you have to go through this for yourself. We can give you the bullet points. We can, we can, all the end coronavirus people can tick them off. You must have them within your own heart so that you can be a leader in this conversation the same way. And going through that administrative exercise of saying, I'm taking this on, what are, what are the facts? Who do, who do I need to talk to? What are what is the list I need to make? What you know? What, we want to help you solve that for your local context because it's going to be different than me. It's going to be different than Tiffany. It's going to be what uh, and Vicky. It's going to be what your what what is around you. You know. I have some things to add regarding the schools. Um, I mean, there are so many great initiatives around the world to support schools, uh, also with distance learning. Uh, for example, there has been uh, this one channel in the UK who has been who have been providing distance learning in um, like bite size um, uh, segments that children can just pick up. They can look at it. They have an online um, tool to work with, uh, so they can do homework uh, along with the the broadcast as well. Uh, like I find this a great initiative uh, because that makes for that the schools uh, also have their hands free to focus on other things so they don't have to provide all the distance learning themselves. Uh, and it could also work if some schools partner up so they can um, uh, they can collaborate on uh, providing all the distance learning because it's a lot of work for most schools to to just um, uh, switch to distance learning all of a sudden like it, it is a lot of extra work that they didn't really sign up for and that we can make a lot easier for them um, aside from that that has really um, 
about uh, the, the schools themselves. Uh, we have done a lot of advocating for um, uh, for safety measures in the schools as well. I, I also just share our open letter. Uh, we have a lot of uh, groups around the world that focus solely on schools. Um, uh, we now have groups uh, from uh, what is it? Netherlands, Belgium, France, uh, Germany, uh, um, Kenya, um, many more. Uh, and they all collaborated on this open letter, uh, which we are now sending out to human rights organizations, uh, because yeah, it's, it's a simple fact that the way uh, that schools are now reopening throughout Europe, it is a human rights violation. Uh, it, it goes against the, um, the right to health. Uh, for the kids and unfortunately not many people are uh, speaking up for the kids um, and one of the things that we have done in the Netherlands is we actually sued the state over safer schools uh, we're actually now waiting on the, the final verdict on that um, and we are also helping uh, different groups around the world to do the same so we're helping them with crowdfunding uh, to actually uh, yeah make a change in the in the policy regarding schools uh, so there are so many ways to to look at this and to approach this and i think all the ways uh would be helpful in the end uh but it really comes down to um yeah what you want to focus uh, on thanks to ollie i'll take you up on that uh briggs and i'll i'll take a look, look at what you put thank you thank you um, I can see that we're down to a group of a lot of our core on continuous volunteers. Um, I'll mention Thomas is here. He's running our Team Costa Rica. Um, uh, and uh, I actually have to sign off myself, but thank you so much to my regular volunteers and to the people who joined us for the first time today. Um, appreciate you all very, very much. Well, um, thanks breaks for for helping this um be a success today and um thanks to everybody else bye bye hi briggs mom judy's on here <laughs> <laughs> sometimes our moms come to work with us <laughs> Well, I'm going to go ahead, if there's not any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and drop off as well. But um, it's been wonderful. It's nice uh, meeting you, Vicki. Nice seeing you again, Sam. And um, great question, Tom. And um, thank you, everybody, for, um, for joining in and participating. This has been great. Yeah. Hi, Sam. It's good to see you. Hello. You were on mute. Oh. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you, Vicky was on mute. Oh, Vicky. No, I'm just really, uh, like my audio is really bad. So sometimes you just can't hear me, but I'm not on mute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but nice to meet you too. So informative. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna hop off as well. Yeah, Bye. me too. Great meeting. And um, yeah, if, if anyone has a question, do reach out. Great. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.